I'm gonna admit them. Some of the tips that we talked you through already here related to the walkthrough inform people uh, so that they be doing their best job. Good morning, everybody. We'll just start and we'll start in just a moment. Folks, if everyone could please, um, if you could please mute yourself um, as you're coming in, then we'll get started. All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Integrating Motivational Interviewing and Logo Therapy to Help Clients with Co-Occurring Disorders Recover with our presenter, Mark Sanders. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Great Lakes MHTTC and SAMHSA. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA under the following cooperative agreements. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services and SAMHSA. The MHTTC network believes that words matter and uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. For more upcoming events and information, please follow the Great Lakes MHTTC on social media or visit our website. A few housekeeping items. If we're having technical issues, if, um, please individually message me, Jen Winslow, or Rebecca Buller in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we will be happy to assist you. Um, and also, if you can make sure you stay muted, uh, that would be great as you're coming in. Um, if you have any questions for Mark, please put the questions in the chat and we will do our best to get them addressed. Um, we will be using live transcription during the presentation. At the end of the session, you will be automatically redirected to a very brief survey, and we appreciate you taking just a moment of your time to fill that out. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the full session, and this can take up to two weeks. Um, one more note is that slides and materials will be available on our Great Lakes MHGTC website also within the next two weeks. Our presenter today is Mark Sanders. Mark is the state project manager for the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC. Mark has worked for 40 years as a social worker, educator, and part of the SUD workforce. He is founder of the Online Museum of African American Addictions, Treatment, and Recovery, and co-founder of Serenity Academy of Chicago, the only recovery-oriented high school in Illinois. Mark is also an international speaker, trainer and consultant in the behavioral health field whose work has reached thousands throughout the United States, Europe, Canada, the Caribbean, and the British Islands. Recently, Mark Sanders was named as the 2021 recipient of the NADAC Enlightenment Award, Award in recognition of his outstanding work and contrib contributions to NADAC, the field of SUD services, and SUD professionals. He is also the recipient of the Illinois Association for Behavioral Health's 2021 Lawrence Goodman Friend of the Field Award in honor of the many years of dedicated service Mark has provided to communities throughout his home state of Illinois. Welcome again, everybody, and I'll turn it over to you, Mark. You're muted, Mark. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Christina, and good morning, everyone. I always like to begin with a story. And this story is about my first student. The year was 1986. And that was the year I started teaching alcohol and drug studies at a community college. I had 40 students in class. And there was one student who arrived earlier than the rest. He sat right in the front row, the center aisle seat. He was there like 15 minutes before the other students arrived. And as I was teaching, he was leaning forward while the other students were sitting back. So it was clear to me that this student 
was hungrier for the subject matter than the other students. So eventually I learned his story. He went from prison, death row, where he was on solitary confinement to my class. He was serious from death row to my class. I learned that he was on death row for the one crime that he didn't commit. You know, he'd share with me his story. He says, Mark, I was addicted to heroin and I was a gang leader. The one crime I didn't commit, I was on death row. And I asked him, what was solitary confinement like? He says, I don't talk about solitary confinement much. What I'll tell you is that when you're in solitary confinement, minutes feel like hours, hours feel like days, and days feel like weeks. He said, I thought I was about to lose my sanity. And so I needed to distract myself. He said, someone left the book in the cell. I decided I would read the book to keep my sanity. He said, I hadn't read much. I dropped out of high school my first freshman year. But I figured that if it was something interesting in the book, it'd probably be in the middle. So he took the book, he tossed it in the air, and he said, whatever page it lands on is where I'm going to begin reading. The book was called The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And the page it landed on was the page in the book where Malcolm X was incarcerated and could not read. Does anyone know how Malcolm X learned to read in prison? I'm glad you asked. By reading the dictionary from cover to cover. So my student requested a dictionary. He learned to read. Then the next thing he requested was a law book. I said, why'd you request a law book? He said, because I wanted to study how do you fire your public defender? My lawyer was sleeping on me in the courtroom and I was facing the death penalty. He beat the case. A few years ago, he received an award as the Substance Use Disorders Counselor of the Year in the state of Illinois out of 8,000 certified counselors. He's received national awards for his work in promoting substance use disorders recovery, criminal justice recovery. You see, I share these stories. Part of my secret is that as Jen mentioned in my biographical sketch, I'm in my 40th year as a certified alcohol and drug abuse counselor and recovery stories keep me inspired. That's how I've been able to spend four decades doing this work. The presentation today is entitled Integrating Motivational Interviewing and Logotherapy to Help Clients with Co-Occurring Disorders Recover. So we begin with the definition of motivational interviewing, a collaborative person-centered approach. Now, the idea that this approach is collaborative is a no-brainer for you. But let me suggest to you that when I first became a counselor 40 years ago, there was hardly any collaboration between clients and the therapeutic team. It was always the doctor knows best, the therapist knows best. A collaborative person-centered approach. Let us take a moment to chat with each other. Here's my question. You can put your response in chat. This is by way of review. What's meant by the person-centered approach? What's meant by the person-centered approach? person-centered approach. Any responses there, Jen? Not yet, but I'm sure they're coming. Oh, somebody said, person drives the science. The patient, client, consumer leads the goals and treatment plan, meeting the person where they are at. Excellent response. Let me suggest to you again that in the past, when we work with individuals with addictions and mental illness, there was no meeting the individual where they were at. There was no client lead you follow. Uh, geared towards strengthening a client's internal motivation to change. There are five principles of motivational interviewing, express empathy. And there are two ways under the umbrella of this model that we express empathy. One is through total acceptance. You know, I work with lots of clients with co-occurring disorders who hadn't showered in years, homeless, the only clothes they had were the clothes on their back, right? And many people found themselves judging these individuals. But the key is, with motivational interviewing is I'm gonna to totally accept you as a human being. Another way we express empathy through motivational interviewing is through uh, accurate empathy. That is uh, by reflecting the client's feelings. You sound hurt, you sound embarrassed, you seem like you were angry when that happened. What they've discovered is that when we can accurately express empathy towards clients, it improves the therapeutic relationship. 
The second principle of motivational interviewing is to avoid arguing. What Miller says is that when we argue with clients, it makes them defensive. And in a state of defensiveness, they're less likely to review whether or not they should change. The third principle is role with resistance. With motivational interviewing, clinicians see resistance as a sign that you need to either slow down or change direction. The fourth principle is support self-efficacy. An incredible story about this man who went fishing. On the dock where he was fishing, there was a snake that had a frog in its mouth. The man pulled the frog out of the snake's mouth and the snake was slithering away in tears. Feeling sorry for the snake, the man reached inside of his jacket lapel and he gave the snake a shot of Jack Daniels, a shot of whiskey. The next day, the man showed up to fish and he walked on the dock and the snake was there to greet him. And this time he had two frogs in his mouth. What's the lesson of that story? When we get enthusiastic, when clients make small amounts of progress, our enthusiasm can motivate them to do more. So anytime clients make progress, we get excited about it. We support their self-efficacy, their own efforts to make change. The fifth principle, develop discrepancy. People change when there is a discrepancy between the current behavior and an important goal. So I, thinking about that fifth principle, I'm reminded of a client of mine who always wanted to be a better father than his father. Do you know how many men I've worked with who's told me they wanted to be a better father than their father? And one day he was planning to pick his kids up from school, but he had a craving for a cigarette. His kids were over here. He drove 30 minutes in that direction to get a pack of cigarettes. And then he drove back to pick up his kids. And he realized that he kept his kids standing in the rain for a whole hour. That created an, an, a, a discomfort in him, an internal confrontation, internal confrontation, because his desire to be a better father than his father, right, was in conflict with his decision to go back 30 miles that way and buy a pack of cigarettes. That was the last pack of cigarettes he had ever smoked. People change when there's a discrepancy between the current behavior and an important goal. But then I thought about it. I work with clients who had homelessness, who had co-occurring disorders, years in the hospital, years in treatment centers. So how do you help clients who are so focused on basic needs, like where they're gonna eat today, where they're gonna wear, and where they'll spend the night and have no time to think about their goals? How do you help clients who have forgotten about their goals? How do you help clients who have no hope that their goals are attainable? You know, Don Coyas was quoted as having said, our clients don't hit rock bottom, they live on the bottom. Bottom is their address. He talked about some of his clients having no hope that they can pull themselves up. So how do you motivate such clients? Then I read where William Miller, the founder of Motivational Interviewing said, if you have other ways of motivating clients to change, besides what we've put in, this, put in this book, by all means, integrate it within our models, within our model. Then I remembered that I studied logotherapy on my own. Logotherapy is a form of psychotherapy that emphasizes meaning and purpose. The approach is developed by the renowned psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. This model can be found in Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for meaning. Logotherapy is a therapy that helps clients discover their purpose. It is derived from the Greek word logos, which means perfect. Well, there's a story about this client of yours who said that his destiny, his vision, his purpose, his mission was to be an artist. And this great artist was in a car accident where he was paralyzed. He was so angry and bitter, he met with you. And you asked him, what makes you an artist? And he said, my hands and I can't use them, I'm paralyzed. And you said, no, that's not what makes you an artist. You said, what makes you an artist is that you were born to be an artist. So you taught him to paint, holding the paintbrush between his teeth. Viktor Frankl says that few things can stop purpose. And what I've discovered in integrating this approach with motivational interviewing, this particular approach gives clients hope and a reason to want to live. And if you can do that, then it's easier to create a discrepancy between a current behavior and a goal. You see, I learned that Viktor Frankl never had to wind up in a concentration camp. He was a renowned psychiatrist, and his parents said to him, Victor, the Nazis are coming. 
you should get out of here and leave America. You can work as a psychiatrist in America and you won't be, you won't be in danger of being killed by the Nazis. So Viktor Frankl took that long ship journey on the ocean and he arrived at Ellis Island and he saw the Statue of Liberty and it brought tears to his eyes. And Viktor Frankl wrote, and I quote, he said that there were people walking around in the United States in New York and people in prison in Rikers Island in New York in prison who were freer than people walking in the streets where he lived in Vienna. So he wrote, and I quote, Victor Frankl said that we ought to erect a statue of responsibility in California facing the Statue of Liberty in New York to remind everyone that lives in this country that where there's that much freedom, there's a responsibility to do something with our lives. Victor Frankl was hired to be a, a, a psychiatrist in New York, but he did what you would have done. He went back home to give his mother another hug. And while he was gone, he learned that the Nazis bombed the synagogue that he attended. So he walked past the synagogue and he picked up a brick off the ground. It was one of the Ten Commandments, the one that read, honor thy mother and thy father. And Victor Frankl says, I'm not leaving my parents. And a week later, he was captured by the Nazis. And thus his famous quote, you can take everything away from a person except for one thing, the freedom to choose, how they will respond to whatever horrible circumstance they find themselves in. Viktor Frankl called that the last of the human freedoms. So what he decided to do was not to treat the concentration camp as a concentration camp. He decided while he was in captivity that he would treat the concentration camp as a psychological laboratory where he would go around studying how people were able to survive something so horrendous like a concentration camp. And what he noted and what he wrote in the book, Man's Search for Meaning, that those who took their affliction and turned it into purpose, that purpose helped them survive. It helped them maintain a sense of hope. So he told a story about a school teacher that would gather the kids together while they were in a concentration camp and teach school every day. He told the story about a nurse who provided medical care while in a concentration camp, the rabbi, who still taught church services, still had services, religious services, while in the concentration camp. You see, I'm convinced that if you were in prison, that what you're doing now, you would still be doing if you were incarcerated. I have a, I have a friend of mine that works in our profession. She was an alcohol and drug abuse counselor and she relapsed and she wound up incarcerated for three years. And one day I gave a speech at that prison and the counselors told me that that particular incarcerated friend of mine, after about a year of being incarcerated, she started teaching the recovery classes while she was in prison. Victor Frankl said that few things can stop purpose. He went on to say that there are 11 things that give life meaning. One of them is the attitude that one takes towards unavoidable suffering. That few things uh, create purpose more than life pain. In other words, you show me your pain and I'll show you your purpose. You and I are living examples. The research says that helping professionals that we experience more trauma in childhood than any other profession. And what you've done is you've taken your pain and you've turned it into purpose. You use it to help others. Can you think of individuals, um, perhaps some of them who are famous that suffered adversity, affliction and they turned it into a cause? Um, I have one. There was a woman who started an organization called MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Her daughter was killed by an intoxicated motorist and she used her pain to form her purpose to help make sure that others don't die uh, in crashes connected to drunk, intoxicated driving. Can you think of other examples of people who have taken their affliction and turned it into a cause? You can put your response in chat. Or, or Jen, do they have the, uh, the ability to unmute themselves as well? They do. Okay, feel free to unmute yourself or you can put your response in chat. People have taken affliction and turned it into a cause. In my town, there's a program called Live Falali. There was a mother whose daughter died of a, of a, um, a heroin and opiate overdose. And she travels the state, making sure that every part of the state has Narcan 
to decrease the chances that others will die of opioid overdose deaths. What story do you know? Somebody said a son of a drug addict is now an addictions counselor. Happens all the time. Thank you for sharing that. What else? There's a man by the name of John Walsh. I think his child was abducted, right? And he does work um, to really find children who, are, who have been abducted, children who are missing. Victor Frankl says probably more than anything else that nothing provides more purpose than meaningful work. As you know, the future of employment in America is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And what research indicates is every time manufacturing jobs go away, uh, coal mining jobs go away, jobs get shipped abroad, you always expect to see a heroin or an opioid overdose crisis. Suicide goes up, depression goes up when jobs go away. Victor Frankl says that meaningful work gives life meaningful meaning. In fact, I'm convinced that every substance use disorders, every mental health, every co-occurring disorders program in the country should be aligned with supportive employment because jobs give life meaning and purpose. So Victor Frankl said that um, sometimes when he was in captivity, right? Love gives life meaning and purpose, he said. The Nazis would torture him and he would close his eyes and he would pretend that he was holding his wife's hand. And his desire to hold his wife's hand one more time was one of the things that kept him alive. Almost every man, uncles uh, in my family, father, um, had drug-related deaths. And after my father died smoking cocaine, my uncle Isaac went in front of a judge. He said, Your Honor, I don't want to die. I don't want to go to prison. I want to live. And the judge said to my uncle Isaac, why should we put you in prison? You've been committing crimes since you were 10 years old. My uncle says, you're correct, Your Honor. I've been committing crimes since I was 10 years old. And I know the law. I'm a, I'm a jailhouse lawyer. And based upon what I know about the law, you'll probably let me out of prison in February. And it's cold in Chicago in February, and I don't own a coat. I'll steal one, and you'll incarcerate me in March. He put my uncle in treatment. The year was 1987. My uncle was the first person in our family to go to treatment. And the counselors called his 13 siblings, invited them to participate, participate in his family work. They said, we're not coming. We don't like him. He owed all of us money that he stole from us to buy heroin. The counselor was persistent. He called my aunts and uncles a second time and says, we have food. They said, they'll be there. We'll be there. And all 13 of my aunts and uncles, including my mother, participated in my uncle's family night. And then the aunts and uncles, they invited 26 nieces and nephews. In other words, 39 of us in total participated in my uncle's recovery his, in, when, he was in, when he was receiving therapy for substance use disorder, 39 of us. He was the first person in the family to ever get into recovery. We now count 30 relatives within our family who are now in recovery. What my uncle told me was that he started believing that if he got into recovery, that he could get the love back of his family. Love gives life meaning and purpose. Victor Frankl says that doing the will of God can provide purpose in one's life. Some of you are aware of the story of Ruby Bridges. There she is right there. Ruby Bridges was an eight-year-old African-American girl who integrated the public school system in New Orleans in 1960s. National Guards escorted her to school each day as there were mobs of thousands with weapons screaming obscenities at Ruby Bridges. We will kill you if you go to this school. So they assigned the famous psychiatrist by the name of Robert Cole to work with Ruby Bridges. Dr. Cole wondered, how come this eight-year-old child doesn't have post-traumatic stress disorder? You have mobs that are greeted with weapons telling that they will kill her. How come she doesn't have bad dreams and nightmares? So Dr. Cole asked Ruby Bridges, why are you going to school every day? And here's what she told me. She said that she believed that God put her on earth to uplift the educational plight of African-American people. And Dr. Robert Coles wrote that even an eight-year-old child that has a sense of purpose, that sometimes purpose can be protective against illnesses like post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Victor Frankl says that taking a stand can give life meaning and purpose. Some of you are advocates, you take a stand. Rosa Parks took a stand. Malala Yousef um, Zali took a stand. Remember when she was shot in the, in the face by the Al Qaeda and she said, they should have killed me, so now I'm not no longer afraid of dying. I no longer just want to help girls in my country be educated. I want to now help girls all over the world. Surviving that expanded her sense of purpose. She took a stand. Patriotism, according to Viktor Frankl, gives life meaning and purpose. Patriotism. Helping others, for that is your great secret. Incredible story about this baseball player named Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig played baseball 100 years ago. He was teammates of, with a man named Babe Ruth. How many of you have ever heard of a baseball player, Lou Gehrig? In the 1940s, they made a movie about Lou Gehrig's life called Pride of the Yankees. And he went in front of 40,000 screaming Yankee fans and he gave the following speech. Today, and there was an echo in the stadium, today, 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 I feel I feel, I feel, I feel like the luckiest man, 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 man on the face of this earth, 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 earth. Today, I feel like the luckiest man on the face of this earth. How can Lou Gehrig be lucky? He was dying. He was dying of a condition, which they later named after him, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. So I looked up the backstory. The story that I read was that the day before he gave that speech, right, his retirement speech, his death speech, there was a 12-year-old boy in the hospital. The boy was sick. He was dying. And the boy refused to take his medication. And doctors told his mother, your son will be dead soon unless he takes his medication. The mother knew that Lou Gehrig was her son's hero. So she called the Yankee organization and asked if Lou Gehrig could come to the hospital to convince her son to take his medication. So he showed up and the boy's eyes got so big, he saw his hero and he said, I'm still not going to take my medication unless you hit a home run tomorrow. Lou Gehrig said, okay, I'll hit a home run tomorrow. He didn't hit a home run. He hit two. Now fast forward. Right before he gave the speech, the mother called the Yankee organization and word got to Lou Gehrig that her son started taking his medication. He felt lucky because he was able to help someone. And you're fortunate because you get to help someone every day. You are on purpose. If people only knew the sense of purpose we experience by helping others. Creativity gives life meaning and purpose according to Viktor Frankl, using your artistic gifts to make the world a better place. Bob Hope, one of our early great stand-up comics said that he became funny so that he can go on the battlefield during World War II and cheer up the troops and help them to laugh. And Stevie Wonder said that when he felt the greatest sense of purpose is when he created a song, a birthday song, dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which became the anthem uh, for Dr. King's birthday to become a national holiday. Bono said that when he was a young lad in Ireland, they were being oppressed. He was watching television. And he saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on television giving the I had a dream speech. And a young Bono said, I have a dream too. If I'm ever well known, I'm gonna do good things for people in the world. A number of years ago, he used his uh, creative leverage to go in front of the United Nations. And La Bono was able to convince the wealthiest nations in the world to forgive the economic debt of some of the poorest nations in the world, using your artistic gifts to make the world a better place. Oprah said she felt the greatest sense of purpose when she built a school in South Africa for girls. And today, some of these girls are getting bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs, using your artistic gifts to make the world a life-changing experiential journey. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever traveled anywhere and it changed you? You were not the same when you returned? You felt a, great, a greater sense of being alive, a greater sense of purpose. If you can answer yes to that, would you share with us in chat, in chat where you traveled to? Where was the journey? Where did you go? How did it change you?
What do you see there, Jen? Someone said not yet, but looking forward to it. Your way, yeah. Um, I personally feel that in Mazatlan, Mexico. Um, Rebecca said, Rebecca, how do I pronounce that? Dachau? Dachau. It's a concentration camp. Also, oh. let me ask you both a question. And so, Jen, how did traveling to Mexico change you? Um, I just got to know a lot of people there and just experienced a, a different culture and different um, established relationships. And I go back and see people almost every year and been going 10 times now. Oh, wow. And then uh, Re Rebecca, and how did you travel? How did your uh, experience uh, uh, at a concentration camp, how did it change you? Um, I think it embedded, I was a child. So my, my parents took me there at a young age and I think it really like forged a huge empathetic note in my life. Right. I, I can think of many times that especially the Holocaust has caused me to, to feel things more deeply than I've ever felt anything. It, it, it enhanced my empathy gene. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Where did you go? How did it change you? Somebody else said Habitat for Humanity International to El Salvador three times. And yeah. another one said Kenya, Africa. Yeah. You know, I used to work in a program. Thank you. Uh, I used to work in a program where these kids were seeking recovery, but they also would raise funds to take these kids like all over the world, right? And it made them feel like more connected to the world, right? It increased their self-esteem, which ultimately helped them with their recovery. I visited a country in Ghana, West Africa, Ghana, where the average income was $300 a year. Could you imagine if your income was $300 a year and the people's spirits were so strong? $300 a year. It changed me. If I ever met Victor Frankl, I would say to him, yeah, along with like, you can't change how people respond to a situation they find themselves in. Also, too, uh, people keep their spirits sometimes as well, right? They still have strong spirits. A tenth thing that gives life meaning purpose is a near-death experience or reaction to death. How many clients have you worked with with co-occurring disorders that nearly died because of their either the things they did when they uh, were mental illness related or their substance use? Incredible story about this former gang leader who was 16 years old in Chicago. And he was in a, a shootout with a rival gang member who had a gun to his head. The gun jammed, right? No bullets came out. The guy saw this as a miracle from God, so he got a job at Burger King. And the other gang members were laughing that the gang chief was working at a Burger King. They were laughing at him. The owner of the Burger King saw something in him, leadership. He said to this young 16-year-old, if you give up gang activity, I will teach you everything there is to know about the fast food industry. I read that this young former gang leader wound up opening 100 Burger Kings and 57 Pizza Huts. Jen and I were in a workshop yesterday and a young man who's a mental health advocate and I can tell one of the great therapists, right? Talked about attempting suicide in the gun jamming, right? Contributing ultimately to our purpose, a near death experience, or reaction to that. Looking out for the next generation. This is the story of many, I would say, recent immigrants who in their country of birth are doctors, lawyers, dentists, right? But they come to America and they're often told, well, that degree doesn't hold up here. So some of these individuals are driving cabs. And when you talk to them, they'll tell you their purpose in driving a cab is to send their kids to college or to send money home to the country of birth. And what they've discovered is that sending their kids to college or money home to their country of birth gives their life meaning and purpose. What happens when a human being's life lacks meaning? They may find themselves um, walking aimlessly through or wandering aimlessly through the world. Inertia, boredom. Maybe that's why before we came up with the new person mental health movement and evidence-based practices like supportive employment, when I work with clients who have mental illness, some of them would pace all day. They would just pace all day, living for the lottery. Destructive pleasure seeking when one's life like meaning, psychiatric decompensation, physical deterioration and aging. 
Because you ever notice that sometimes when a person goes to a nursing home and the activities stop, that they can age, overwhelming guilt. Because I'm a grief specialist, I get these amazing calls. I've gotten calls from grandparents who told me that the grandkids visited their home and they fell asleep near the pool and the grandchild died. I've talked to a number of grandparents about that. And each one of them decided that they would take up a cause because they were so stricken with grief and guilt, they would promote pool safety. Anger, rage, and the desire to punish the world. So I live in Chicago and uh, we have lots of shootings in Chicago, right? Lots of young men who shoot others. And I've been the therapist for quite a few of these young men. And what all of them suffer from as a person that I've worked with is what we call father hunger. They were deserted by their father and they're filled with rage and somebody has to pay. Victor Frankl says, if you're working with clients that are filled with anger and rage and they have the desire to punish the world, you, they, they will do that to the world unless you can help them to make sense of their suffering and to turn that suffering, that pain into a cause. Depression, suicide attempts, suicide and addiction. You ever heard of a man by the name of Buckminster Fuller? Buckminster Fuller is so many motivational speakers. He's so many motivational speakers, mentor. Here's a story. Buckminster Fuller was living in Southern Illinois and he felt suicidal. So he got in his car, he was chronic in his alcoholism, alcohol use disorder. He got in his car, drove to Lake Mission in Chicago and he was gonna jump in the lake and commit suicide. And he says, as he was standing in front of Lake Michigan, he said that God spoke to him and said, don't jump. There are people who need you. Go back home. People need you. So Victor Frankl drove back to Southern Illinois and he got busy helping people. He became an inventor. His most well-known invention is the architectural blueprint for the indoor football stadium. He made millions of dollars but he gave it most of the way in charity because he said God said people needed him. He's on purpose helping people through the money he was making. But Mr. Fuller said he had given away so much money. That there were times when his family needed money. And he wrote, every time my family needed money, some would show up right in the nick of time. Here's what I know about many of you. You help people for a living, you're on purpose. And I bet that some of you can share the story because you're on purpose and you help others where well, you needed some money and a little bit showed up, always in the nick of time. Feelings of uselessness when one's life lack meaning, relapse and death. So I met a woman who's about 100 years old and she's a Holocaust survivor. She was on Schindler's List. I was able to see the branding underneath her skin where the Nazis branded her, they gave her a, a number. Where I met her was at a mental health conference in Missouri. And she was the keynote speaker. She'd gotten a PhD. She'd gotten a PhD in psychology when she was between 70 and 80 years old. Can you imagine that? And she taught psychology in a doctoral program in California. She's keynoting this conference. And an hour later, I'm delivering a workshop on logo therapy. So I was scared because I said, she's gonna leave her keynote. She's gonna come into my workshop. And as an actual Holocaust survivor, she's gonna know I don't know anything about the Holocaust, nothing about logo therapy. And sure enough, she came to my workshop. She sat in the front row and she listened to my presentation on logo therapy. And when the presentation was over, she gave me a hug and she said to me, I met Victor Frankl. I danced with Victor Frankl. She says, if Victor Frankl were alive, he would be proud of you. It brought tears to my eyes. What she was talking about is I developed some techniques based upon the work of Victor Frankl, techniques um, geared towards helping clients have a, a vision for um, things they can accomplish in their future, a sense of hope and a sense of purpose. Sometimes I do with clients what's called visualization exercises. So I invite you at this time to join me in a visualization exercise. 
And there are three ways you can do this. You can do this with your eyes open, your eyes closed, or you can write. Again, the one way you can know that these exercises I'm about to share with you can actually work is to try it. Eyes open, eyes closed, or you can write. Now I invite you to take a moment to get comfortable in your chair, and that can involve planting your feet firmly on the ground. What I'm gonna ask you to visualize is an ideal day, a perfect day, 10 years from today. So that year will be 2032. Let us begin. On this ideal day, this great day, I'd like to ask you to visualize yourself waking up in the morning. See yourself waking up. And in the space where you wake up, there's a mirror. Take a look at yourself in the mirror. How do you look? Does anyone wake up next to you? Take a look at that. Visualize the room that you wake up in. It's ideally suited for you. Now look at the rest of the living quarters. Look around. You like what you see. On this ideal day, you go outside. You feel the red weather. This is your ideal weather. What's your ideal weather? Visualize that. You know it's gonna be a great day when you feel the weather. On this ideal day, you take a moment um, to just uh, do what you wanna do. What's the first thing that you do on this ideal day? You can do anything you want on this day. And what do you do next? And then what do you do? On this ideal day, you sit down for a few moments to reflect, just a few moments. And the first thing you reflect on uh, is your life purpose. A decade from today, you are living your life purpose. Take a look. What's your life purpose? You take a moment to visualize, think about the legacy that you're leaving the world. You're leaving quite the legacy to the world. Visualize your legacy. On this ideal day, you're at peace, emotional peace, spiritual peace. Feel how it feels to be at peace for a day. For one day, you have no physical pain, no back pain, no knee pain. Feel how it feels to have no pain for a day. A decade from today, you have improved your finances. Take a look at your finances in 10 years. On this ideal day, you stop for lunch. This is your favorite meal for lunch. What's on the menu? Who prepares lunch for you? And who, if anyone, joins you for lunch? Take a look at lunch. On this ideal day, you have more leisure time on your hands following lunch. What do you do with that time following lunch? It's evening, you stop for dinner. This is your favorite meal for dinner. What's on the menu? Who, if anyone joins you for dinner, take a look at dinner. You have even more leisure time on your hands following dinner. You're gonna do something enjoyable, what do you do? Take a look. On this ideal day, 
What time do you go to bed? And what do you dream about? If your eyes are closed, I invite you to open your eyes and thank you for participating. When I've done this exercise with clients, I then pair them after the visualization in twos and they share with their partner what they saw in the visualization. And what I've discovered is that when people talk about their ideal day, their, their energy increases, right? Uh, their voice becomes louder. Some people have a permanent smile on their face. I've seen some people talk about their ideal day. And as they were talking, their eyes will get so large, look like they just smoked crack cocaine. There was a book that's called Optimism, The Biology of Hope by Martin Seligman. He talked about research that says that when individuals are optimistic and hopeful for their future, when people are hopeful for their future, hopeful for their future, neurochemicals are released in their brain like dopamine. In other words, when people are optimistic about their future, some of the same chemicals that are released in a person's brain when they use drugs like methamphetamines and cocaine are released uh, when they're optimistic. A second technique under motivational interviewing that I created is helping clients find purpose in the midst of unavoidable suffering. One of my favorite client questions to ask clients who survived a co-occurring disorder is what's the reason you survived that? My youngest brother called me in 1996. He said, I have a drug problem. I said, I know. My brother said, I need help. I said, I know. So I put my brother in a detoxification facility for three days. He called me on the third day after he was released from detox. He said, I'm bored. Now what do I do? I said, go to a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous. So my brother attended his first Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And after the meeting, he called me in tears. He was crying. I said, how come you're crying? He said, after the speaker spoke at the meeting, I, I looked at the speaker and I said, you spoke the truth. I was there. I remember you. The speaker was a man who used to use drugs and sell drugs with my father. When my brother was a little boy. You spoke the truth, I was there, I remember you. The speaker went up to my brother and said, you don't know this, but as soon as your dad died smoking crack cocaine, I got into recovery. There's a famous expression that some people die so other people can live. He said, you certainly don't know this. He said, when I was out there selling drugs with your dad, he saved my life twice. He said, so I often ask God, why did you save me? Looked at my brother and said, maybe one of the reasons I was saved is so that I can help you. And he helped my brother with his recovery. He was talking about purpose. I was saved to help others. And they both are in long-term recovery. My brother noted in his recovery, because his wife was also in recovery, that lots of people in recovery would meet other people in recovery and sometimes they would fall in love. But there was no blueprint. He said on how two people can be in recovery and have a healthy relationship. So he started a program in his own recovery to help couples in recovery develop healthy relationships and recovery. That became a part of his mission, his life purpose. Another technique is to use um, Socratic questions either in groups individually or autobiographically to help clients discover their life purpose by asking questions like, what do you do well? How many of you believe that it takes a special skill to be able to live homeless, homeless without a job? Or how about a special skills to support a, a substance use disorder without a job? What we discovered is that those types of skills are transferable in recovery. What do you do well? Second question I ask clients, if you knew that you had one hour to live and you were asked to leave a message to the world, what would you say? What I've learned is that however a person answers that question really speaks to what's dearest in their heart, their greatest ambitions. What would you do with your life if you knew that you could not fail? If I could ask clients one question, the next question is the best question that I know. What is your previous life suffering preparing you to do with the rest of your life? As Viktor Frankl says, most people will discover their sense of life purpose. Life purpose usually comes from life pain. Every therapist that I know that specializes in working with trauma survivors are themselves trauma survivors. If money were not an issue, what would you do with your life? 
when you die, what do you want your headstone to read? I actually did this with a group of teenagers seeking recovery. One teenage girl said, I want my headstone to read that she died a successful woman who sincerely cared about helping others. I said, well, how will you achieve that? She said, in order to stay, be successful, I have to stay in recovery a day at a time. I have to stay in school, graduated from school, get a really good paying job, and then remember that people helped me. So now my purpose is to help others. And then the final question is what is your life purpose? Why did you survive that? Why are you on earth? We now have credentials throughout the country called uh, recovery coaches or certified peer-based recovery support specialists. These are individuals who are in recovery from mental illness, addiction or co-occurring disorders, and they are now on purpose, they help others. So I also do these exercises where I help clients set short and long-term goals and write down their personal mission statement to guide their life in recovery. There's an exercise I do that's called a life plan exercise. And the purpose is to help our clients self-actualize. I first started doing the life plan exercise with my graduate students when I was an instructor in social work schools. And I did this so that they can begin to look at their own self-actualization so they can be empowering towards clients that they work with. As you know, there are all kinds of plans. There's treatment planning, relapse prevention planning, wellness planning, some of you do wellness planning with clients where they make plans for mental, emotional, spiritual, physical uh, growth. Happiness plan, let me let you in on the secret, I've studied this. The happiest people in the world are the people that do the best job of living in the moment. Think about it. If we spend a lot of time in the past, there's lots of regrets. We spend too much time in the future, there's lots of anxiety caused by future worries, right? But those who can stay in the moment, right? The moment is almost always okay. Think about it. Right now you're in a webinar. Everything is okay. But then you start thinking about the bills you have to pay next week and suddenly everything is not okay. The life plan exercise about pursuing self-actualization. So first I did this with students and then clients. They journal. Unfinished business you intend to complete. Sometimes unfinished business gets in the way of us reaching for our goals or self-actualizing relationships you plan to nurture, your life purpose, your happiness plan, 10 things you wanna learn in this lifetime, giving you something to look up for, 10 places you wanna go. As a matter of fact, I'm taking a trip this August, I'm gonna drive around half of the United States. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. I wanna see some things. Let's take a moment with the chat. Where are some places that you'd like to go in this lifetime? Would you put that in chat? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to visit? What do you want to see? I want to go to Paris. I want to see the Eiffel Tower. I want to go back to Hawaii. I want to see the water that's so clear you can see your reflection. The only place I've ever seen it is Hawaii. What do you see there, Jen? We have Africa, Dubai, Latin America, and Egypt. And they said that they want to redo a trip they did with their husband before they married and spend more time in each place. That could be really um, interesting. Yeah. South America, Canada, Africa, Victoria Falls, Sicily. See, even thinking about things we want to learn and places that we want to go, create some future orientation. 10 things you want to possess, 10 people you want to meet, and who you ultimately want to become. In groups, I bring in quotes with my clients with co-occurring disorders. Quotes like, there's an advantage in every disadvantage and a gift in every problem. And I ask, I ask the clients to share stories from their own life about whether or, not this, uh, whether or not this quote is true and to share some evidence that indicates the truth of this quote. So I would never ask clients of anything that I haven't done first myself. There's an advantage in every disadvantage and a gift in every problem. The first part of the quote, I had difficulty with, an advantage in every disadvantage. No, actually I had no problem with that because I grew up economically poor. And I feel that growing up in poverty helps me have more compassion and empathy for people who suffer. It was the second part that got me and a gift in every problem. Because as I mentioned to you the last time we met, I'm a bereaved parent. And 20 years ago, my first child died. Where's the gift? I found it. 
that after my son's death, people mailed me grief books, 50 books on grief. And I read all 50 of those books. And I took courses in, in like how to be a grief therapist. And I'm now a grief therapist. Had I not suffered that loss, I wouldn't be a grief therapist. So our clients exchange stories from their own life and they inspire each other through story. So let me just ask you, I can't see you. So we've been together through half of our time together. Um, I wanna know, um, are you getting anything out of the presentation? So would you put in chat uh, from your perspective what's the most important thing that we've talked about so far? This is my way of determining whether or not this is helpful. What's the most important thing we've talked about so far from your perspective? People are saying, yes, I really appreciate the examples you were offering on ways to support a desire for change. Somebody else said purpose, um, individuals having a need for meaning and purpose. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Jenna. Thank everyone for your responses. So what I've discovered is by using logotherapy, we can help clients think about their goals, right? A spark can come into their eye about their future where they have a little hope. Now they're ready for motivational interviewing. Skills and motivation interview and asking open, uh, the opening statement. I believe that I agree with Miller that opening statements are really, really important, right? What the opening statement conveys is that I will support your desired change. I will not attempt to direct the change process. So let me ask you a question. Pretend that you are about to meet with a client who's 19 years old. He has some depression, right? And he uses drugs in order to cope. A co-occurring disorder. And... He's mandated to meet with you by his probation officer after he tried to steal a computer from Walmart to buy some drugs. He's 19 years old, mandated to meet with you. He's never had counseling before. While he's on his way to meet with you, what do you think he's saying to himself as he's traveling to meet with you? First counseling session ever, 19 years old. What's he saying to himself? Let's chat. That it's pointless, waste of my time. He's saying I should get high first. I don't need this. Yeah, so on his way, right? He's saying, I'm not going to change. I don't have a problem. I don't need this. This is a waste of time. By the way, I did have a 19-year-old client that came to meet with me. It was mandated. He told me that he didn't know if I was a man or a woman. So I said, what were you thinking uh, when you were on your way to meet with me? He said, all I was thinking was that I wished you look. I hope you look like Beyonce. I'm like, no, I don't look uh, uh, like Beyonce. Okay, very good. So here are the opening statements. I'm not gonna try to tell you what to change or how to change. I'm here to find out what's going on in your life and I will help you make any changes you decide to make. I know I cannot make you stop getting high. I will honor whatever decision you make concerning your drug use. I know I can't make you take medication. I will honor whatever decision you make concerning meditation, medication. And what the client learns through these opening statements is that I can't make you change, it's up to you. You don't have an opponent here. I'm not your opposition. Additional skills of motivation interviewing are what we call ORs, asking open-ended questions, affirmation, reflection of feelings, and summarizing. These are person-centered techniques. So Miller in developing motivation interviewing, as you know, half of it was borrowed from the person-centered approach. He calls it the person-centered guiding approach, right? So first I build rapport with you and then we're able to help you, challenge you by helping you make decisions as to whether or not you should examine changing. Stage-based interventions. How many of you are familiar with these five stages of change? The first stage being the pre-contemplation stage. In this stage, the client does not feel that they have a problem that needs to change. Uh, we call that the clueless stage. The second stage is contemplation. The client is aware of having a problem and is ambivalent about making change. Third stage, preparation. The client is motivated to do something about the problem, but they haven't done it yet. They're motivated, they haven't changed. It's like a runner on the starting block who hasn't taken off yet for the race. The fourth stage is called the action stage. The client is actually engaging in actions to bring about change. And then the fifth stage is called maintenance. According, according to Prochaska de Clemente, the client is in the maintenance stage has been in recovery for six months or longer. 
So when a client is in pre-contemplation, the goal is to raise doubt. You know when resistance occurs? Resistance occurs when someone is in pre-contemplation, they don't even think there's a problem and we're acting like they're ready for action, right? But the goal when someone is in pre-contemplation is to help them to raise doubt, to get them to think, I might need to address this. That begins, according to Miller, with developing a person-centered relationship, always relationship first. Another way we can get clients to raise doubt is by providing information. One of the best things I ever did was to convince a psychiatrist to meet with our patients that had co-occurring disorders once a week in a group to provide education about mental illness, the biological basis of mental illness, what happens in the brain when you have mental illness, uh, education about various types of mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and what we learn is that when clients receive more information about mental illness, right, there was a whole lot less resistance and a whole lot more medication compliance. Also, when someone is in pre-contemplation, they don't think there's a problem that needs to change. Stories help. One of my favorite techniques is to recommend that clients who don't think they have a substance use disorder attend open 12-step group meetings and listen to the stories of the people in the room. But you go to three tells open meetings, and if they really do have a substance use disorder, you and I have discovered that someone in that room is going to share a story that sounds so much like more like so much like their story, that someone is gonna, they're gonna think that someone planted them there, right? As a spy, that you sent them there to tell their story. Values clarification. Would you write down your five most important values? One of my values is loyalty. What are your five most important values? So we would ask clients to write down their five most important values when they were in pre-contemplation. If someone has written down those values, um, I invite you to um, unmute yourself um, and uh, share with me in chat what you wrote down. Anyone willing to do that? What are your five values? Aaron or Dana, would you be willing to read yours out loud? I guess I can. I wrote honesty, loyalty, motivation, hardworking, and love. Okay, so who's reading this? Is this not Aaron or Dana? It's Aaron. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Aaron, would you be willing to uh, pretend that you are a, a client of mine? Sure. Okay, and so um, so in this, what we're doing here, so you have some uh, depression, right? Which, by the way, is the number one mental illness that co that, that uh, coexists with um, substance use disorders. And um, I'm going to ask you just in our practice, Aaron, in our role play session here. Oh, by the way, um, how do you spell your name? It's E R I N. Ah, let me ask you this, because I was spelling it myself. And what letter do you think I was beginning with? A. Yeah. So, you know, in my lifetime, I haven't met many people whose name Aaron is spelt with an E, right? How many have you met? Um, several. Okay, several, okay. And uh, can I ask you a question just about your name? Sure. Okay. So, Aaron, there are 7 billion people on earth, right? Um, of all the names that they could have given you, um, how do they choose that name Aaron for you? And who named you? Um, my parents, and they just like the name. They just like the name. Mm -hmm. You sure that's the whole story? I believe so. Well, let me show you what, let me share with you and why I asked the question. Sometimes I say, well, go back and ask them again, right? Then they'll tell you, they'll add something to the story, right? Can I take a, a stab at something? Sure. I believe that when parents give their um, children names that are pretty rare and spelled in unique ways, what they're saying to the child, there's nothing, no one like you. You're an original. And we brought you in the world. We expect you to be who you are. There's something really original about you. Thank you for taking a moment to just um, share with us information about your name. So Aaron, I'm gonna invite you in our practice session 
uh, to make up a story. Give yourself three drugs that you use. You're making this up and two of the three are illegal. Okay. Um, marijuana, cocaine, and um, Tylenol. Okay. Let me, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, thank you. So Aaron, marijuana, cocaine, and Tylenol. What kind of Tylenol? Um, just maybe extra strength. With codeine? Um, no. Let me ask you this. When you use, um, take marijuana, cocaine, and alcohol, and uh, Tylenol, do you drink also alcohol? Yes. Can I ask you if you ever drink um, when you take the Tylenol, the cocaine, or the marijuana? Yes. Okay. And thank you so very much about um, being up front and, and so honest with me, because you know, lots of people tell me, they won't even tell me the drug of choice, and you did so freely. You also acknowledge that you, uh, um, that you drink sometime when you use these drugs. Can I share one other piece of information for you? Sure. You're free to do what you want with this information. It's your life. Um, disproportionately, individuals I work with who wound up in an emergency room of hospitals, right, after taking certain drugs, like Valium, Librium, Xanax, Tylenol, you know, et cetera, um, they're more likely to wind up in the emergency room of the hospital after they've drank alcohol along with those drugs. And almost 70% of people that have opioid overdose deaths uh, at the time of death, not only do they have opiates in their body, they have alcohol too. So we're learning it's not just the opiates, but it's the alcohol too. What are your thoughts about that reaction to what I just said? Um, I guess I didn't think about it that way. And what are your, what are your reactions having, having um, taken a moment to think about it? What do you think? Um, I don't think it's going to happen to me. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Aaron, uh, you mentioned uh, three drugs, marijuana, cocaine, and Tylenol, right? And then you also generated a list of your five most important values. Uh, would you go down the list starting with the first value and making it all the way down to the bottom and, and, and share with me what impact, if any, has your drug use had on those values? Okay, honesty. Um, I'm constantly making up stories to um, protect myself from um, and to protect family members. So I feel like I'm honest in different ways. Um, that I ask you a question. It sounds like what you're saying there is that uh, even though honesty is a value of yours, your intent to your intent in making up those stories is not the intent to harm. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. You can keep going. Thank you. Um, loyalty. I am loyal to um, people who I'm close to, and um, I don't let things come between me and those individuals. And has your substance use had any impact whatsoever on the loyalty? Uh, yeah. What's been the impact? Um, it's gotten in the way. It's in, impede my ability to be there and be present, and um, and to always and to be able to be honest. What's that like for you? Uh, I feel guilty about it, and then I want to cycle and use again. Oh, you made that real clear. So what I've learned from you so far, Aaron, is that when your drug use interferes with like important values like loyalty, right, honesty it makes you experience guilt. And then in turn, you deal with the guilt uh, by using more drugs, is that correct? Yes. Thank you for your honesty. What about the third, the next value? Um, motivation, uh, I always, or I, I always try to give 100% and, um, and I want that from those who are close to me. And what impact has any has your substance use had on that? Your ability to give 100%. Um, I guess there's some mornings that I can't get up. What's the impact of that? Um, I'm not available for my family. And how do you feel when you think about that? I feel bad and guilty. And then what happens? Um, then I, uh, am in a bad mood and, um, want to yell at 
people like care about. And what impact does that have, if any? Um, it creates a whole discomfort in the home. What impact does that have? Thank you for sharing. Um, then it makes me feel guilty and uncomfortable. And then what do you do? Then I want to escape. How? Through use. You know, you're very uh, introspective. How about the next value? Um, uh, hardworking. That goes back to that 100%, giving 100%. And now thinking about it, I'm not able to give 100% when I'm using. You know, some people, uh, even though they may not be good 100% in some areas of life, they put a lot of energy into, uh, into figuring out how they're going to get high today and recover from that high. How about you? Um, that requires work, too, in other words. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I guess I do probably think about it often. Okay, and is there one more value? Yeah, I also wrote love. And what impact, if any, does your substance use have on, on, on love? Um, it makes me not fully available because of my thoughts being somewhere else or I'm not fully present. Um, and then also having guilt. And what do you do with those feelings? Um, I stuff them. Well, thank you so very much for uh, sharing. And again, um, I know you know your values because of how quickly that you wrote those down, right? And that you also, as I mentioned before, you, you're quite thoughtful, right? So thank you so very much. Thank you, Aaron. Would everybody join me in giving Aaron a virtual round of applause for practicing with me? Thank you so very much. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Yeah. So let me ask you, what was it like, um, this process that you and I, what was it like for you? Um, uh, I guess a little uncomfortable, um, even though it was like role playing. Um, mm -hmm. But also not uncomfortable because okay. of your um, responses. I didn't feel judged. Um, oh, so you didn't feel judged. Okay. No, um, I felt like you were just interested and it gave me um, some of your questions made me like challenge maybe my belief system a little bit, surfacely challenge it. Okay. So you mentioned something very, oh, by the way, Aaron, what's the reason I, um, I, I began asking you just about your name? Maybe to create rapport and to make me feel important. Yeah, you know, I've learned, I, I've taken a, a page from like the original motivation interviewing work. If you can find ways to engage and be inspirational, then add them to what we do. I have found that just asking people about their name um, helps me with early engagement. With this model, always relationship first. So, um, and thank you uh, so very much. And I, I talked with the group. Um, what did you, you all can take a moment to, um, uh, to just chat. What was I trying to do there with Aaron? Aaron, and how did I do? What was I trying to do? How did I do? Somebody said engage, establish a relationship, gain some history. You know, thank you very much. The other thing I was really trying to do is help Erin to get comfortable in, in our meeting together and to get her to make the, uh, get her to take a look at her alcohol and drug use without me telling her this is a problem for you. So she listed her most important values and then she talked about the role, if any, that if any is an out, that there are substance use might've had on those important values in her life. And what she said was that it made me, I was comfortable because you were working to engage me but I was also a little bit uncomfortable, which brings me to a point that when you can get clients to feel comfortable with you and then they examine their life, the impact of like frequent hospitalizations, not taking medication, their drug use on their life, that creates some internal discomfort, which is an internal confrontation. 
right? You see, if I tell you that this is a problem, you can resist it and deny it. But if I can help you relax and you tell me this is a problem, you're more likely to own it and do something with it. Next, I invite you all to write down your five most important roles. For example, I'm a brother, a son, and I'm a friend. What are your five most important roles? Somebody said mother, daughter, sister, mother, daughter, social worker, friend, and wife, aunt. So what I would do, thank you, Jen. Thank you, everyone. What I would then do when someone is in pre-contemplation is again, ask them to write down their five most important roles. And then simply ask them, ask them, you know, what impact of any has like, uh, you know, not taking meds or what impact of any um, of uh, um, not, you know, um, their substance use had all those important roles. And once they share uh, the impact, then it's harder to be in pre-contemplation. You've gotten them to raise some doubt. Feedback from significant others, loved ones, can also help someone move from pre-contemplation to contemplation. So when someone is in contemplation, um, one thing that helps that is they're ambivalent about whether or not they should change is to do what we call a balance sheet. Here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. Would you take a moment to write down five decisions that you're gonna to need to make in the next five years. Real decisions about your life. Five decisions you're gonna to need to make in the next five years. One of mine is whether or not I should retire in five years. How about you? Five decisions in the next five years. Someone said sell home and move. And I would echo that for myself. It's a big decision. That's a huge decision. Okay, so next what I invite you to do is take a pen and draw a line straight down the center of a page. Draw a line straight down the center of a page. A vertical line in the middle of the page, all the way down. Now, taking one of those five decisions, just one of them, pick one out of the five, on the left side of the line, on the left side of the line, I want you to write down all the reasons to act on that decision on the left side. On the right side, all the reasons to not take action. Left side, all the reasons to act on the decision. Right side, all the reasons not to act on the decision. One side, all the reasons to act. The other side, all the reasons not to act on that decision. Would anyone be willing to share um, the items you wrote on both sides of the line? You can either unmute yourself or you can put it in chat. All the reasons to act on the decision, all the reasons not to act on that decision. Do you have to have a certain amount for each one? You'll, often they do, yeah. So the, were you able to get some things on both sides both sides of the line? Well, I'm the one that put like either sell my home and, and, and move. Oh, we ain't, let's, let's hear about this. What'd you put on both sides of the line? Reason to act, reason to sell your house and move, reason not to. Well, the reason that I should is if at the time, at some point, like the property value is now higher, but at some point when I really want to decide if the uh, property is worth more than what I paid for, um, it's one reason that I should. One reason that I should not is because I put a lot of work into my home and to then sell it and walk away is, uh, you know, seeing that all the work I put into it would be hard because then I feel like I'll have to start all over somewhere else. Um, one reason that I yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. One reason that I should is 
you know, the area is still really uh, good and nice, but if at any time that area changes, uh, that would be a reason that I would move within five years. All and right. Go ahead. one and another reason what should not, um, because I am pretty happy, it's close to my job, it's close um, to where I work, so the time is, is not bad getting to and from work. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. There's a convenience there, you know, your neighbors, it cuts down on the commute, all of the above, right? Right. All right, out of curiosity, having looked at this, where are you leaning towards? What do you think? Well, since it's a five-year gap, it's right now is really hard to, to say right now. It's just that transition over time would tell. And thank you. You know, when I first became a, a co-occurring disorder specialist, we were like cheerleaders for what we wanted our clients to do. Cheerleaders for take your medication, take your medication, take your medication, right? Uh, go to AA, go to NA, right? Cheerleaders, right? And what I discovered is sometimes the more we talked about one side of the ambivalence, what we wanted our clients to do, the more they would lean in the opposite direction. What this approach does, it allows clients to weigh it themselves. On one side, I, I want to take my medication. On the other side, I don't want to take my medication. Put some items on both sides of the line. And only when they can weigh both sides of the ambivalence are they in free to make an informed decision. Okay, this next exercise we're about to do is called all the negatives that can happen if. All the negatives that can happen if. Let us chat. You are working with a client who smokes two packs of cigarettes per day. Would you put in chat all the negative things that can happen if they actually stop smoking cigarettes? They smoke two packs a day. Said cravings. Gonna, what'd you say, Jenna? Cravings, gain weight, withdrawal headaches, withdrawals, uh, find out they have cancer, coughing for a week or two, physical sensations. So you all have made the arguments for the reason that some people continue to smoke. So here's the next equation. You're working with a client who drinks two packs of alcohol, two packs of, uh, I'm sorry, two pints of whiskey every day, two pints of whiskey every day. And they've been doing this for 20 years, two pints a day for 20 years. Would you write down all the negative things that can occur if they stop drinking alcohol? DT, seizures, withdrawal. You know what, Jen? We could actually stop right there on the first one. Delirium tremors, right? Um, alcohol withdrawal is the deadliest just about of all withdrawal, delirium tremors. Delirium tremors can kill you. So you say to a client, stop drinking. The client is thinking, it'll kill me because the last time I stopped drinking, I had five seizures and was rushed to the emergency room. They think that they, they shut off all conversation because you don't get it. If I stop, I'll die. One more situation. You're working with a client uh, that has mental illness, right? And the doctor thinks they should take medication for mental illness. Their family thinks they should take medication for mental illness. Would you jot down all the negative things that can happen if they actually take the medicine? Everyone thinks they should take the medicine. By the way, none of the people telling them to take the medicine has ever taken the medicine. All the negative things that can happen if they actually take the medicine. Weight gain, internal disappointment, diabetes, side effects. Okay. You all have just spoken to dissertation, so listen to this. In a world that judges people based upon weight, you tell the client to take medication. The client is thinking, the last time I took medication, I, I gained 40 pounds and now I have diabetes, right? Client is thinking that my medication makes me impotent, right? So they shut down all conversation with you. I've discovered that clients with co-occurring disorders have some of their most intelligent conversations about medication when they're talking with other patients in the 
in the dining hall or something like that. Often they don't think that we get it. So speaking to both sides of the ambivalence really allows clients to weigh their options. Can you tell me about the part of you that wants to take medication? Can you tell me about the part of you that does not? The part of you that wants to stop getting high, the part of you that does not. And only by being able to speak to both sides of the ambivalence are they able to make informed decisions. When someone is also in that third, second stage of ambivalence contemplation, uh, we wanna honor what's called the four laws of ambivalence and that's what we call guiding questions. So the first law of ambivalence is the law of paradox. It says when counselors choose one side of the ambivalence, clients often feel they have no other choice but to choose the other side. I choose you to stop drinking, client says, nope, I'm resisting that because you chose it. Stop taking med take medication, nope, because you chose that, I'm going in the other direction. The law of freedom. Clients will often make decisions that lead to negative consequences for them if they feel their personal freedom is taken away. So everybody needs choices. So I like to have a menu of options, right? Because when people have choices, they feel less resistant to what we're offering. The law of conflict. Conflict occurs only if two people have conflicting goals. I remember early on in my career, I had a goal to help clients with their recovery. That was my goal. And that was more resistance. I had magical thinking. My thinking was, if all of my clients get into recovery, then maybe my, all of my aunts and uncles would stop getting high. Maybe my grandfather would stop drinking. And maybe my father would stop smoking crack cocaine. And ultimately, my father died smoking crack cocaine. And it clinically freed me. Because what I realized when my father died smoking crack cocaine, is I have no power whatsoever as to whether or not someone will stop using drugs because I had a conversation with him, my father, three months before he died smoking cocaine. I couldn't stop my father. I can't stop anybody from getting high. So I changed my goal. My goal shifted from trying to help you stop getting high towards to be the best counselor I can be. And what I discovered is that when my goal shifted, there was less conflict because my goal to be a, a good counselor was not in conflict with your desire to continue to use or not taking your medication. The fourth law of ambivalence is my favorite. It's called the law of I heard what I said. It simply states, when clients choose one side of their ambivalence, they hear what they say and they will cling to it not because they believe it, but because they said it. If I can give you an example, they will cling to it not because they believe it, but because they said it. I was traveling with my oldest sister for three days to pick up her grandchild in Wilmington, North Carolina, from Chicago by car, and we're driving through the Smoky Mountains. Have you ever driven through the Smoky Mountains? It takes some courage to drive through the Smoky Mountains. There's fog in these mountains, they're winding mountains. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm holding the steering wheel with two hands trying to concentrate because it was difficult to see because of the, the smoke, the smog. My big sister must have been, felt like this might be it. So she asked me a question she'd never asked me before. She said, Mark, how do you feel about my marriages? I said, I'm glad you asked. My big sister has had three long, horrible marriages. So I answered, I asked, I answered her question with a question. I said, you ever find yourself staying in any of those marriages longer than you thought you should. Every one of them, I said, what would happen? I would bring them home and mom would say, our mother would say, he's not a good man. And I would say, yes, he is. He is a good man. And she said, and I would cling to it, not because I believe it, but because I said it. This law speaks to the damage that occur can occur with premature diagnosis. The client is in pre-contemplation. They're not ready to hear you have schizophrenia. They're not ready to hear you have a substance disorder. You make the diagnosis without a relationship. I don't have that. And they spend the next 15 years proving it by not taking medication, by not going to 12-step or other types of meetings. And guiding questions. Client lead, you follow using guiding questions. Even though you don't believe that alcohol and drugs are a problem for you, what concerns, if any, do you have in this area? Speaking to both sides of the ambivalence. Can you tell me about the party you want to take medication, the party that does not? What are the advantages and disadvantages of continuing to use drugs? 
the client mentions uh, a concern. Ask for elaboration following by an example. Can you give me an example? Yeah, even though I don't think I have alcoholism, the last time I got drunk, I started coughing and blood came up. When the client makes that disclosure, her eyes get really big because she heard what she said. The last time I had a drink, I coughed up blood. She's just confronted herself without you doing, use extremes. If you continue with your current behavior, what's the most extreme case scenario? The judge says, if I commit another crime, I'll do 10 years in prison. What's the best outcome if you change? The worst outcomes if you don't change? Is anyone else in your life concerned about this? That can create an internal confrontation. If you don't change, what do you think you'll be in five years? Looking back, what was your life like before this? That question we've discovered can help create an internal confrontation. We wanna make sure that when someone's in the third stage, they're ready to change, but they haven't taken action yet, uh, that we help them to take action. One way is to provide a menu of options. People love choices. Remove barriers that are getting in their way. Hold their hand, take them to the next case management meeting or a group. Uh, if all else fails, harm reduction. I'm not ready to stop this behavior, but I will reduce the harm. And of course, techniques that are part of MI to deal with resistance. So we also, using motivational interviewing principles, want to be able to assess the importance of change using scale questions. On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being high, how important is it for you to change? If the client says it's only a two on a 10 point scale, their next question is how come it's not a zero or a one? And as they talk, they begin to tell with you what their motivation to change is. It's because I really wanna see my kids again. You've discovered the motivation. On a scale of one to 10 with 10 being high, how confident are you that you can change? So if you're working with a client who tells you the importance is a 10, but their confidence is a one because they've relapsed repeatedly, importance of 10, confidence of one, then you know your task then is to help increase their confidence that they can change. So we can ask questions that elicit change though. I, although you're not ready to change, what would be a good first step? What obstacles do you anticipate and how would you deal with them? How would you go about making that change? What gives you confidence that you can do this? As they talk about what gives them confidence, they can actually take talk themselves and the change. And explore sources of support and hypothetical change. If you did change, how would you do it even though you're not ready to change? Who would be your biggest supporters? Confidence ruler. On a scale of one to 10 with 10 being high, um, um, how, important is it for you to, how important is it for you to change? Client says, on a scale of 10, one to 10 with 10 being high, uh, my confidence is a three. You then ask, what would it take for you to go from a three to a seven, from a lower number to a higher number? And as they talk, they can actually talk themselves into considering change. Review previous assessments and obstacles they've overcome. So here's the exercise that I've done with clients. I was working with a young man who was 20 years old and in recovery, but at 21 as a ward of the state, he was gonna to have to be emancipated. He was gonna to have to leave the facility and live on his own. He was scared. So using this technique from motivation interviewing, I asked him, what are the greatest obstacles you've ever overcome in your life? And here's what he told me. I never had contact with my father and that was devastating. My mother told me that she wanted to abort me. He said, my uncle sexually assaulted me repeatedly. He said, I rode the train for two years when I was homeless between the ages of like 17 to 18. I was homeless. I rode the train every night. He said, and the biggest of all, the only man who ever loved me, my grandfather, just died. And after he wrote those five obstacles down, he looked at me and he said, if I handled all this, I can move. Just looking back, gave him what he had overcome in the past, gave him a, a confidence that he could do this. Would you jot down your five greatest qualities? I'll give you one of my qualities, determination. One of my qualities is determination. What are yours? Loyal. How about others? What are your what are your positive qualities? Um, 
think more are coming in. I think they're typing out um, patience. So the technique here is that when you're working with clients that like lack confidence that they can make a change, technique would involve getting them to write down their five positive qualities, picking one of them, and then sharing a story that illustrates they really do possess that quality. And sometimes um, verbalizing qualities that you possess can provide some confidence that you can move forward with your life. So I've been talking for well over an hour and a half. We want to see who has a question. And you can take a moment to put your questions in chat. Or you can unmute yourself and share those questions. This is the question. We've had three sessions on co occurring disorders. This is the third, final session. This is the question that you're gonna wish you asked uh, when you uh, log out of the webinar as you're headed to lunch. I wish I'd asked this question. What's your question? I have a question. Yes. Um, what do you do when you are trying to get the client to recognize something such as like, um, like classroom avoidance and um, then they find the good in avoiding. And so it's like, you're not getting them where they're supposed to go. Yeah. They're finding the opposite. So, so you're talking you about avoiding a classroom that can lead to the certificate or a degree or something like that? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, so I agree with Abraham Maslow, who said that if our only tool is a hammer, then every problem seems like a nail. So multiple things that we can try, right? And um, pessimism only sets in when you run out of things to try, right? So we talk to our colleagues, how have you handled situations? So we can ask questions like, so, so you say the situation they're avoiding the classroom, right? Yes. Avoiding the classroom, right? So you can ask questions like, uh, what happens with you internally? Like, what are you feeling when you think about going to class, right? And of course, being able to get in touch with those feelings, right? Might help them really understand this better. Uh, what would make it easier for you to go to class? Even though you're not ready to go to class, right? If you went to class, what would be the benefits of that? Even though you don't really want to go. So I could get a high school diploma. And what could you do with a high school diploma? I can work. You know how many jobs in the future um, are connect, are like being offered in the country for people who don't have a high school diploma, right? The answer is hardly any, right? So there are some benefits for it, right? So what would need to happen in order for you to lean closer towards going to class? Let's take a look at that. So I think a number of different techniques like that might help. Thanks. Do you see any other questions? I don't, but I am putting, you had mentioned your previous two trainings and I am putting the links to those recordings, those products um, in the chat right now. Okay, very good. Any other questions or comments? So what I've learned over the years, it's a lot less about anything I teach and more about the action that you take. So here's my question for you. Um, what's the action you're gonna take as a result of the time we spent together in this webinar? What's the one thing you'll do as a result of our time together? Uh, instead of type, can I say something? Yes. Okay. Um, I definitely like the component, which is why I uh, registered for this, is the logo, helping them find meaning and purpose. Yes. I am the co occurring coordinator at our agency. It, it's just some of the biggest challenges you said it when, when you were talking about those reasons why not. Like you said, I could die or they've known themselves for so long yes. with substances. And although they are hearing and are able to identify the negatives, the worst, things like that, sometimes I feel it outweighs that um, the other side of if I stop, I'm going to have to go through these sensations and feelings that I don't like, I don't want to have. 
And even though they're really saying they're motivated, they want to, but to, to deal with that is more difficult for them. Yeah, so then my question for you is that given the reality of what you just said, I mean, our clients present with really challenges and sometimes there's the absence of hope and optimism. My question for you is how do you keep your optimism high in the face of that? Well, I, I just try to relate the best way I know how because I try to just put myself in a situation that I know that I may do that is not healthy for me. And I ask to look at myself how difficult it is for me to maybe change that behavior. So it just helped me to be more empathetic for them and just to be supportive to them the best that I can, um, to be understanding and um, meeting them where they are. Um, yeah. But it's just it's difficult sometimes because it's like waiting really a long period of time for them to move just to that next stage and level. And I get that and I'm patient with that. Um, I, I just see it's a challenge for other clinicians that I'm working with. So Yes, and so, and so the question is, and how do we help our colleagues keep their motivation high? Mm -hmm. And what, what I've tended to do is uh, bring into staff meetings periodically people to tell their recovery story. And sometimes some individuals tell their recovery story and their situation seem more bleak than some of the clients we're working with. And those stories remind us that recovery is possible. I've also found that some of our clients, we might refer them to an external mutual aid group like Dual Disorders Anonymous or Marijuana Anonymous, and they don't want to go. So I figured out ways to bring these stories in-house so that our clients can be inspired by our recovery stories. You know, I, I read that Mother Teresa said that there's dignity in holding the hand of a dying person, even if they never made any progress in their life. So just the fact that we care, I think it really does matter, the fact that we, that we care. But what some of our clients will do they may not achieve permanent sobriety, but they might have a month here of recovery, a month there, a month of mental health stability, a month there, right? But what that's doing ultimately is helping to improve the quality of life for periods of time, cutting down on the money needed to pay for treatment. And then one day we look up and a miracle occurs and they've transformed. And that causes us to believe in miracles. Any other questions or comments? So Jen, we'll ask you, what did people put in chat? What's the action? Um, I just, Dana said that um, really, really think about, about and explore life purpose with my patients. I work in long-term geropsych. psych. Your comment about the pacing really hits home regardless of their setting. Helping them see and find purpose seems like it would make my heart full. So here's the story. So my mentor's mentor was dying and he called my mentor and asked if my mentor would fly in Florida where he lives, the Kalamazoo Mission. And he said, will you fly here before I die and help me write one more article before I die? The mentor got on a plane. He flew from Florida to Kalamazoo, Michigan. He's sitting at his mentor's bedside and said, I love you, but this is really strange. Why are you writing this article on your deathbed? You've written 500 articles. You revolutionized behavioral health through your pen. Why are you writing this article on your deathbed? His mentor quoted that philosopher who said that each of us dies twice. He said, the first time you die, it's a physical death. They'll have a funeral for you. And the next time you die, it's the last time someone on earth speaks your name. And if you keep helping clients with their recovery, there'll be people speaking your name for a long time. And thank you so very much for all that you do. And I'm wishing you that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, just a reminder, you are gonna be automatically redirected um, to a very short survey. It's how we are able to provide free trainings to you all. So if you could um, please uh, fill that out, that would be fantastic. Um, I put some links into the chat of our um, MI and expert training calendar, as well as our MHTCC events calendar. So feel free to check that out. And again, thanks everybody for being here. And thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Bye, everyone.